Uh, okay, well, welcome everybody to uh, my studio, Images by Design is the name of the place. I'm Jim Setzer, and uh, this is just another one of the workshops that I do every, every other Monday. Uh, today's topic is uh, Lightroom under the hood. We're not actually going to be doing any photo editing. This is all about the guts of the thing and why it seems so unintuitive and cumbersome and uh, we're going to discuss all that stuff so it can help you better understand how to work with Lightroom and make your workflows a little bit more efficient. Um, I always start out the agenda with kind of a welcome and ask everybody to introduce themselves. Uh, again, I'm Jim Setzer. This is my studio. I've been working with Lightroom since probably about 2010. So uh, I've seen it come through a couple of iterations and improvements and not so, not so good things as well. Uh, we'll be taking a look at that. So with that, let's turn it over to say who you are, maybe what you shoot, and what is your current relationship with Lightroom? <laughs> wow. Uh, my name is Liz, and I've gone through Lightroom's three, four, three, five, and six. Mm -hmm. I don't have the cloud though. And um, you know, I'm just here to uh, to learn what I can. Um, I have a Canon 60D and a Panasonic mirrorless, and I go back and forth depending on my mood between them. Good, good. All right, Annette. I'm Annette. I shoot Nikon, uh, mostly landscape and just anything that I like. Um, I'm in Lightroom, been using it since early 2015, and I do subscribe to the cloud. Okay, great. Michael, I uh, shoot Nikon, a couple different models, D500 and 7200, and um, Lightroom, I uh, shoot the landscapes, animals, whatever, a little bit of everything, just trying to challenge myself and learn. Lightroom, just for a couple of years, I am on the uh, cloud with that, so. Do I know what I'm doing? I know enough to be dangerous. That's about it. <laughs> yeah, I got so many questions and I don't know if there's enough answers. <laughs> well, none of us in this room have all the answers. This is just more of a conversation. Everybody probably has a little bit different level of experience, different platforms, whatever. So this is me just regurgitating stuff. This is us trying having a conversation and sharing our experiences. So thank you, Michael. Go ahead. I'm Viola. Hi, Viola. I'm a Nikon girl. All right. <laughs> like that. I'm in uh, dealing with li Lightroom since 2011. Yeah. I do have the newest version of Lightroom and yeah, it's a learning experience every day. Great. I'm Mickey, I'm old school, I shoot film, but yeah. learning digital, started building computers because of digital back in 2001. Never got to really try Lightroom, but that's why I'm here. Okay, great. Thanks, welcome. I'm Tanya. Um, I just got a um, Nikon D750, so that's what I'm trying to learn. And um, Lightroom and I hate each other. <laughs> uh, well, maybe we'll change that a little bit, right? <laughs> I've I had it. I've subscribed to it for like five or six months, and I can barely get my photos imported. It's ridiculous. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's where I'm at with that so great you came to the right place yes I think. I, yes <laughs> yes um, uh, my name is Becky Little I'm all Becky. the way from Gloucester so well, it's quite oh, a drive well, to get well, here yeah. um, I have I'm an icon girl as well I'm D90 <laughs> that I have just been using the crap out of uh, I got a 50 F18 that lives on it and um, do portraits and some weddings when I get the opportunity uh, my relationship with Lightroom is that uh, after it was recently shown to me, probably in the last year, I was like, oh, this is so awesome. I love this batch editing thing. <laughs> so, um, I'm just skimming the surface. I know that there's so much more that I can do, and I'm, that's why I'm here. Okay, great. And there's Brian. I'm the only Canon guy here. <laughs> <laughs> so you just stand in the back of the class, that's right? right? Stand in the back. That's why I be standing. Um, I've been in uh, Lightroom for about two years on the cloud. I shoot landscape, and my latest passion is uh, surf, shooting surfers. Oh, cool. Great. Well, with not, your camera, right? Yeah, with my camera. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you're not by yourself. Liz is sometimes with you. Okay. Yeah. Part-time Canon. Mm -hmm. Part-time. Yeah, all right. Uh, my apologies. Uh, I'm missing the one layer zero problem with this big monitor, so I'm going to be jumping up and down, and, and hopefully everybody can see this monitor. Luckily, it's a pretty small group, and we'll be able to kind of hopefully follow along uh, best we can. <coughs> Maybe.
Okay. I'm going to set the Wayback Machine back to the 19, late 1950s, early 60s when spinning magnetic media first came about and kind of revolutionized computers. Before that, it was all on tape. Um, the, the thing that spinning platters, old Winchester drives, did was it gave us random access to all the information that was on those spinning platters. And it presented a, an interesting problem. How do you access, access all that data? Um, the computer accesses it by a pointer. It's a long string of ones and zeros that says where the physical location of the start of the file and the pieces of the file and the end of the file are as that platter spins around. But us human beings, we can't deal with that. So we needed to come up with structures by which we could interface and tell the computer how to go out and find the, the information that we <coughs> needed, right? Uh, so how do we do that? Well, like most things human beings do is we um, we looked around our physical world and we tried to find an analogy, and the analogy we found was file folders and cabinets and things, because that's what we lived, right? That's how the office world worked. So why not just replicate that concept? And that's how the whole idea and concept of, of file folders came about, right? Um, everybody, I, I should ask, what does everybody use, uh, PCs or Macs? Let's okay. Show of hands, PC? Mac? Okay, good, 50-50. Uh, it doesn't matter, right? All these tools work about the same. Ever since the early days of Unix and CPM and DOS and RISTC and all those early disk-based operating systems, file folders have just been something that we've lived with. Um, who's, who's been around computers long enough to have w worked with old disk-based operating systems, yeah? What was the oldest uh, computer you, you worked with that had a, a disk based file structure? Well, back in the 80s, so my, my, my father was building computers and I really couldn't get into it. I couldn't tell you what it was. Mm -hmm. I started in the 90s. But yeah, so in the home, in the if it was a home PC like a, a IBM clone or something like that, it was probably <laughs> CPM or DOS or one yeah, of those it was early. All DOS back then. Yeah, right, exactly. So that's where all that started. So the interesting thing about all that, the, the, this structure is, it's metadata. So who wants to give a different definition of what metadata is? Anybody? <laughs> no. You've heard the term, right? Everybody's heard the term metadata. All right, well, metadata is simply information about the information. Your file name is metadata. So, snowy egret in pungo.jpg is metadata about the contents of the file. The .jpg tells you and the computer and the applications the format that that information takes, right? It's a JPEG compressed digital image. Snowy egret is metadata that gives you an idea of what the contents or the subject of that file might be. And in Pungo is actually geolocation information. So there's a lot of information that you've added to the data just by giving it a useful file name, right? The file folder structure that you've decided on, pictures, 1972, Pungo, you know, all those kind of, every single one of those branches, those folders and nested folders, is more metadata that you, that, that basically tells you something about those, the contents, right? Because you, you tend to shove things into folders that sort of make sense to you. Does that make sense? <coughs> right? Yeah. All right. Um, so when we talk about pictures, there's a lot of different kinds of metadata. Where we talked about file names and extensions and, and, and folders, that's all good metadata. Um, but we also have a lot of information embedded inside the image file, right? Who knows what EXIF data is? Yes, a little bit? Okay, so uh, uh, give us an example of, of EXIF data. What would you find? Like ISO 100, F11, mm -hmm, yeah. all like how you shot the picture. Yeah, all your camera settings, right? The time and date that the picture was shot, the, t the make and model of the camera, probably the lens, the lens zoom setting or, or prime, whatever. There's a lot of information, right? And then you can open up any uh, image file and look at the properties and go under details and you can find this wealth of information. So that's more <coughs> metadata. It's not the actual image, it's information about the image, right? 
Also, in the images that come out of your camera, whether they be RAW or, or JPEG, there's also a little thumbnail version of that, ex that, that picture. Something that the computer or Lightroom or whatever application could very quickly read without reading the entire multi-megabyte file, grab that quickly. It's always at the very, very top of the file. So it can open it, read a couple kilobits, now you got a thumbnail, voila, it works great. So uh, that's another source of, of metadata. Um, does anybody know what a sidecar file is? These aren't as common. Um, for picture files, uh, the most, the most uh, prominent example of a sidecar file is called XMP. Uh, it's an Adobe standard X extendable multimedia. Hey, Pete. Billy Billy. Extendable multimedia platform, I think is what it stands for. But basically, it's more metadata, but it's in, a, it's in an associated file in the same folder as the image file. This, these actually become really helpful if you're migrating images from one application to another. A lot of that data, like if you were going to migrate from, say, Lightroom to Capture One, all that metadata that you've added to your pictures, like your lights and your ratings and all the other stuff that you've put in there, that stuff would be shoved into a sidecar file and you could use that to move that back and forth and not lose all that really important metadata. Come on in. Come sit down. Come sit down. I'm my big head. Yeah, you're, you'll be out of the way later. I'll block the door. I can smack me over. Yes, Annette, your question. Hold on, let me, let me start the timer this time. Okay, yes, your question. Uh, so what's the thing called? So like you go into Lightroom and you raise the shadows and you lower the highlights. What's the thing called? I thought that was a sidecar that tracked all that stuff. We're going to get into that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that was a little history, a little background information. So now let's just start to touch on Lightroom. And here's my quiz. Uh, you can't read that, but it says, is, the quiz is, what is Lightroom? A, a place to store all your photos. B, a photo editing application. C, a dysfunctional darkroom. <laughs> or, or D, largely confusing and non-intuitive. So who thinks it's A? Anybody think it's A? Oh, uh, you're good. Yes, uh, anybody think it's B, a, a photo editing application? All right, we got three, four people think it's B. Uh, how about C, a dysfunctional uh, darkroom? All right, so nobody's falling for that one? Okay, uh, D, largely confusing and not intuitive. Yeah, okay, a lot, a lot more hands go with that one. Everyone understands Photoshop, so the lightroom's confusing. Yeah, that is you, okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to go with E, none of the above. Lightroom, at its very core, is not a photo editing application. It's a database. I see a couple shaking their head and a couple going, what? What the heck? So what's a database? Who, wants, who has a, a, a definition of database they want to share? It's a repository of files. A repository it's your, it's your of file files. It's a file cabinet. Hmm. All right. Anything else? Anybody else? With pointers. <laughs> pointers, yeah, maybe maybe pointers. Um, yeah, think of it as a way to correlate bits of information from multiple sources. Right? And Lightroom is that. It correlates a lot of information from multiple sources. And that, in a nutshell, is really what it does. So um, that's why things seem to be so confusing. Why is it so hard to import stuff into the catalog? What's that? The catalog is the actual database. Right? It's just Lightroom's name for the database itself. Um, and this database is basically a rec records and records and records of every file you've ever imported through it, not into it, but through it, and all the extra information that Lightroom has brought together and displayed for you in Lightroom to help you understand all the bits and pieces of your images. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay, so let's take a look at some of those things. Uh, you remember I said in the quiz, light, you do not import your pictures into Lightroom. That's a big misnomer. You only use the import function in Lightroom to move 
pictures from, say, your memory card onto wherever you decide you want to put your folders on your computer. You can put them anywhere you want. You can put them in multiple places. You can put them in multiple cities. You can put them in the cloud. You know, the, Lightroom really doesn't care as long as you tell where it is, where the target location, the actual folder location where you stick your files are, as long as it, when it passes through that import, it does a really interesting thing. One, it pulls all that EXIF data, right? It's, it reads all that as it passes through. It also reads that little thumbnail we talked about. And when you're importing stuff in Lightroom, notice it, it starts out with a fuzzy little picture and it's not until you go in and pull up the picture does it sit around for a few minutes and then eventually turns into a decent resolution. That's because it starts with that thumbnail. Until it can build its own previews, it has to work with what it's got. Um, other things that you can do in the, in the import function, we'll kind of take a look at the import box, but there's a lot of other things you can do as you import, and it's a terrible term, uh, pictures through Lightroom as you're bringing them off of your, off of your uh, memory card or wherever you're, you're bringing it from. Some people plug their camera directly in. I prefer to take the memory card out and stick it in a reader because I typically get better performance that way. Mm -hmm. All right, so the database itself consists of uh, a really, really, really big file. And if you didn't change any defaults when Lightroom loaded up, it was it's something called mycatalog.lrcat for Lightroom Catalog. If you're a photographer and you've edited more than 100 pictures, this is probably the most important file on your computer. And we'll explain what that, why I say that later, but just hold on to that thought. The other thing that Lightroom creates as it imports pictures into whatever folder you decide to stick them in is it creates those previews. Sure, it takes the little thumbnail, but depending on how you set things up in your import, it's going to create a number of different resolution images and stores those in a little folder as well uh, and some of those are pretty important. A one-to-one -one preview, that's the one when you zoom in one-to-one, -one, full resolution, that's really helpful if you're going to be culling through a lot of pictures. You don't have to wait 10-15 seconds between pictures while it resolves that nice pretty image. If you have a build those previews on import, it's going to start creating those as it goes. Um, the other really important preview, and you can build, you can have tell different resolutions, but the other one that's really important are smart previews. And who wants to say what smart previews are? Come on, I can't talk here for a full two hours. <laughs> Come on, Pete. Right, you're, the, you're the master. The thing that's neat about smart previews is they are a preview of the file, but if your actual image is offline, like maybe you're smart and store your pictures somewhere else and then you take your laptop on the road, you can still continue to work with Lightroom because it uses that smart preview copy of your image to do all of your edits. That when you come back, Lightroom sees your real folders back, it's all good. But it's not a full res. It's not generally not a full resolution. But usually when you're... It applies your changes to the real file. No. When you, when you come back? Does not apply. Oh. We'll talk about that. Hold the that thought. Side, the sidecar is. Hold that thought. Okay. So, so here's Lightroom, the application running on your computer, and like I said, it just does it. It, it just sticks the files where you tell it to stick the files, and it creates all this stuff over here. And this <coughs> folder structure over here, like I said, where, if you didn't change the defaults with Lightroom loaded, it's going to be inside your Photos album on your computer, regardless of whether it's a PC or a Mac. So if you've ever seen that, that's what that is. <coughs> um, every couple of weeks or so, Lightroom asks you to back up the catalog, mm -hmm. and most of the time we ignore it and move on. Uh, two things. One, I would always back it up. Two, take that backup of that LR cat file and put it somewhere else. So it, if that hard drive crashes or your computer crashes or whatever. And three, you don't need to keep a thousand copies of them. These, that file tends to get really, really, really big. And you don't need to keep every two weeks version for the last ten years because you're probably not going to want to go back to your catalog as it was two years ago, uh, you're probably only really interested in recovering from, say, the last backup. So I'd keep two or three of them, and the rest of them, 
just go into that folder and you see there's date stamps on there. You can just get rid of all the really old stuff because like I said, they do tend to get really big. Any questions on that? Comments? I get nervous to delete stuff. I mean, I had read some stuff about deleting your old um, catalog backups. But they said, but make sure you know it's fine before you do that. Like, how would I even know? I guess, I guess, I don't know. I guess delete it, put it in the trash, and then keep working. And if something's wrong, wait like a couple weeks and then delete it from the trash. Or well, so Lightroom can work with multiple catalogs. If you want to just make sure that a catalog is or the last backup or two backups or three, just go into file catalog and go load up that older version of the catalog, you know, oh. and what you're going to find is, oh, no, my I latest just, I just stuff I sure imported on, is it showing up? On it and, I doubt, and I'm not deleting one that I'm running on, you know what I'm saying? Well, like, how do I know what one I'm running? I only have mm -hmm. one, like I've never changed anything, so everything goes into one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If Lightroom is running and you try to delete it, it won't delete, it's locked. Oh, okay. So just let, leave Lightroom running when you're when you're going out okay. there and culling stuff out. The one that won't go into your trash can is the one that's open and locked. Okay. Multiple catalogs. In other words, my catalog has been my catalog for the past two years. Mm -hmm. So I went and I decided I'm going to strip off all the 2015 photos and make its own catalog. Mm -hmm. 20 hours later and 5 gig, <laughs> that process finished. What the hell did I do? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, moving stuff from one catalog to the next is an arduous process. Uh, Lightroom is, has traditionally been very, very poor performer as far as doing that because it is replicating all of your previews and all the other kind of stuff when it moves from one catalog to the other. It doesn't do a good job of picking up those previews and moving them. So is it a good idea to have multiple catalogs, say, broken by year or by um, month or whatever? Well, you're a great straight man, Pete, because I'm kind of going to start, to, I'm going to talk about the okay. pros and cons of multiple catalogs here in a slide or two. Okay. Um, remember, I, I mentioned that it creates this other folder with all these preview files. Um, depending on your settings in Lightroom, it's going to call those off and get rid of those if you haven't touched them in 60 days or 30 days. You know, you can, you know, those are all settings you can change in preferences. Um, I tend to not work on a project after I've gone through and worked it for a couple of weeks, so I've got mine set to, I think, 20 days. If I haven't touched a file in 20 days, get rid of all the previews. Then if I come back, if I go back into the catalog, I, let, let me go back and re-edit some stuff. Or, hey, I never got around to doing that with those photos. Before I get started, I'll go in and highlight that folder and say, hey, by the way, go create some, go recreate the, the, the previews while I go get a glass of wine or a cup of coffee, depending on the time of day. And when I come back, all those previews will be remade. So it's, it's okay to let it call out those those previews, they're really just there to improve your workflow as you're working with those pictures. And when you're done with the pictures, they're just taking up space. You will never be able to go into that previews folder and find an image. There are these long, ridiculous computer-generated file names and, you know, so that's what they are. Any questions on that? No? Okay. Tough crowd. <laughs> okay. So, when you go, like I said, when you go to import pictures in, in Lightroom, uh, usually you're, uh, you're asked a bunch of things. Um, and I'm not going to go, well, yeah, this one. The first time you fired up Lightroom, you probably had photos stored on your computer somewhere, and it said, hey, do you want me to find your file? Do you want me to find your pictures? And you probably said, sure. And it, it somehow magically imported pictures. Of course, it didn't make copies of them, right? It just created records in that in that database and previews if you told it to, uh, and, and stored those things out. Now, if you had pictures stored in nine different places on your computer, it went and found all the all the pictures on your computer and it created all those entries in the database. So it could be a little bit confusing. I got to go into all that. I'll just assume that all your photos are in the photos folder and now you're doing your day to day where you just take and you're putting your memory card in the computer, you hit the import button and uh, you get a dialog box on the left and that helps you find the media that you're looking for. Right? Usually it defaults to a, some kind of removable storage that it see has been input. Um, it's going to read that and it's going to show you all the thumbnails right out of that exif 
data in the files and put those up there. Um, it also does something interesting. Who, who's imported a bunch of files, pulled the SD card, put them back in your camera, forgot to format your thing, you come back in the next time and Lightroom somehow magically knows that you've already imported some of those and kind of grazed those out. Yeah. Do you have to tell it though? That, to it's an option oh. and we'll, we'll go through that now in, one of, in one of the fields on the right here. But yeah, by default it's going to say ignore a suspected oh. duplicates. So one of the things that Lightroom does when it imports files uh, pictures is it reads a couple kilobits worth of uh, ones and zeros off the top of the file and it, that's kind of its header to recognize that file. So one of the things you guys see when you import all the time is it's going to try to not reduplicate file imports using that thing. It reads that, oh, I see a file that already has this string of bits. That, must, that picture must already be on the computer, uh, that, so I'm not going to re-import it. The other reason Lightroom keeps that kind of string of bits at the top of every file is in case it loses it. <coughs> if you go into File Explorer or Finder, whatever your computer is, and you manually move some of these things around after you've imported them into the catalog, what do you think Lightroom does? Get mad at you. Yeah, it's lost, right? It says, uh, I'm expecting to see this file, and it's, you know, it's going to look at that string of bits, and I'm not seeing it, and you're going to get a big, ugly exclamation point there saying, uh, it's not here, it's lost, and well, it is lost because you, outside of Lightroom, moved it. Um, luckily, Lightroom's pretty good at, if you right click on the little exclamation point, go find this file for me. It's going to go scanning wherever you tell it to scan, and it could be your entire pictures library if you want to you know, spend a lot of time at it. If not, if you've got a tighter, and you, know, you know exactly where you move these pictures to, then you can dial it down a little bit. And it, and it does a pretty good job of finding those pictures. And you really want it to find the pictures because if you made any edits to that picture, the Lightroom can't find the original picture, all those edits are lost. We'll talk about that <laughs> a little bit more now. So you, anyway, you've got, so you got on the left-hand side, you've got your import dialog box where you talked about that. Uh, you, you, your preview pane tells you what Lightroom is going to import. And then you've got a bunch of dialog boxes over here on the right. Most of them are usually minimized, but they're all pretty important. Um, and maybe I want to stop right here and change into uh, my live mode. I don't know if I can or not because I've got this thing going. Well, let me just, let me just uh, scroll through these things. Okay, the first dialog box at the top. And you, you guys know how to work the, these little dialog boxes in Lightroom, little taco chips. You click on the taco chip, and it, and it rotates and opens the dialog box. You click it again, and it rotates and it collapses the dialog box. So the first one up at the top here, file handling, that has to do with, do you want to rename these files as you import them? Um, so, you know, you're, usually your camera does some prefix code and some sequential number and then whatever the extension is and well maybe you don't want that maybe you want to put your name or something at the, at the beginning but keep that that numbered serialized digit or you know you want to do something else with it that's what you do in the file handling dialog box um, and file renaming um, then there's a apply during import and um, that's really helpful if you have presets that you like to apply to every image. So you can select one of your presets. So if you've got a particular style that you work with, like I'm thinking of like, you all know Judith, right? Yeah, she's got a very distinctive style and I, would, I didn't ask her, but I would bet if she was here, she'd say, yeah, I've got a preset that I apply to every image and I do it on the import. Because man, how easy is that? Instead of having to apply it to every file or apply it to a block of files, just do it during import. You could also do things like put your copyright information there your name, some other metadata that you would like to apply to the image. And so it's really important to kind of go in there and kind of set that stuff up. And you do it once, and you don't have to worry about it again. Unless that preset doesn't work with everything. A preset that works with your portraits, and then you go apply and import the landscape with those presets, sometimes they come out a little wonky. Yeah, you want to be careful with, with you know, when you're creating your presets, you definitely want to make sure that you're, you are grabbing only that development, uh, the development uh, fields that are going to apply to that, that kind of import. 
How do you speak so crop is probably a bad one. Local brush stuff, yeah, that's probably a bad one. Yeah, 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 good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, what else can you do? Um, and then destination, that's really an important one. So um, uh, around the room, how do you have Lightroom create your destination? Um, by default, it wants to take whatever your file folder you specify and then add like a year and a month or a year and a month and a day or so one of these formatty things that adds more file folder structure to your pictures. Who does that? I go with them around. No, just you, you flat. I bring them into the computer and then when we import from where the resident on the computer. So I have to deal with that. I was that gonna say, is that is that doing it that way? Is that redundant for Lightroom? If like you say load your pictures through like an image capture or just like a basic load in and then import to Lightroom. Yeah, um, it's kind of you, you guys are, are man, you're, kind of, you're you're great straight men. So <laughs> why would you need to put any kind of additional file folder structure into your pictures when the data is already there? We already said that capture time and date was part of your EXIF data, right? Lightroom knows that. It it knows all that information. So why are you building these redundant and now kind of clumsy 1960s 70s technology file folder structures in there that are redundant? to data that's already in the database. Because my head's not a database and I gotta see it. If it's in a folder, I have to see that folder. I can't rely on my own to make sure I'm in the right area. Not making sense. <laughs> no, no, no. It yeah, makes sense today. It's, you know, we, we uh, those of us who have been working with computers since the 80s and uh, and have just kind of grown up around this, it's very natural for us to want to store everything in these folder structures that we can get our hands around. The problem is that it's, this is really, really poor knowledge management concept. Why? Because if you have a file folder structure and you put everything in there like that, well, that's all well and good if the only time you ever want to sort and filter your pictures is by that folder structure, you can drill down and you can get to that set of pictures. But what if I want every picture of every snowy egret that I ever took, regardless of time, date, location, whatever, I spend forever looking for all the pictures of snowy egrets because all I have in my metadata of the folder structure is what I've already created. If I use something much more powerful like keywords, now, and, 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 a, and I have a much more flat folder structure, now it doesn't matter that I've got one big pictures folder with 10,000 files in it. If I properly keyed all of my images with all the important stuff about it, everybody's name whose face is in there, I know Lightroom's face recognition is kind of yeah, but. Uh, if I've imported and I've added the location, because usually when you do a shoot, you usually get one location or maybe two, Pete, you know, you can add that stuff or you can add in blocks, right? You could just import from the first location of the day and then the second location of the day is the second import and add those keywords on import. Mm -hmm. Now, if I've got all the keywords for all the pictures, I could have one giant flat file structure, but I know I could just click on the little metadata button up on top, tell it the metadata that I'm looking for, and get back exactly that filtered set of pictures that I want. Yeah. It's much more powerful. If, if you had that metadata every time you import and stuff. Or you do, or you do the really painful thing, and, and that was, which is what I did about four years ago. I collapsed all that file structure, and I converted every file folder name into more keywords. So I haven't lost any of the metadata that used to be my file folders because every t I'd click on a folder, I'd say apply the keyword, whatever the folder name was, to every file that's in that folder, and then I would collapse that folder, and I'd work my way back up to the point where I have a, I'm still not one big flat file folder, but I have a small enough number of them that it's much more manageable. And then along the way, you can do both kinds of things that will allow you to add additional metadata, and now you've got really, really powerful things. You can always do it on the fly, too. Yes, you can. So instead of making a file saying, okay, this is Susie's photo shoot, you just go in, you, when you're downloading Susie's photo shoot, you type in Susie, you type in where you did it, 
and then when you search it, you don't have to make a folder that says Susie's Photoshop. Exactly. Yeah, and like I said, the best time is during that import because you you've got an idea of all the metadata that's important to you, maybe the subject and the location or the or the event or the whatever the thing was. Add those keywords into your keyword string field, and now they're all associated with that. Yes. Uh, and it's fairly typical. We do a lot of road trips, and it's like it's nothing for us to hit four different places, no. four different things in one day. Mm -hmm. And it, one be animals, one will be a sunset. Uh huh. Maybe the sunrise first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. get, so how do you do this on the import? Well, I got four different things. All right, so two ways you could do it. One, you can use the uh, uncheck all and then just block the first event, import those, then click the import button again. That first block will all be grayed out, right, because now they're duplicates. Do the next block, the next block. Or if you want to do something different, how expensive are SD cards these days? <laughs> right? You move from one menu to the next, just swap out and put another SD card in there. Now, now that delimiter is now part of your workflow and that's even easier. For me it's easier just to go swap out an SD card if I move from one venue to the next and then I've got that natural block. And then I don't have to keep playing with these check, uncheck all and then highlight and check and you know divide it up <coughs> from a single box. You're talking about like if he goes to Maine and he goes to Arizona for two different SD cards. Yeah. yeah, or well, he goes to a truck dra back. graveyard, and then later in the day he goes to a, 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 a state park. You swap out the SD cards. Now you got two basic import functions you right. do, right? So you put in the first one. They're all the truck graveyard. You pop that. You know, you import that, adding all your keyboards along the way. You grab the next one. Voila, it works. If you remember to remember which winery is which. <laughs> yeah, that's harder to do as you get to the fourth and fifth winery. Yeah. 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 Put little sticky pads and all put them on your SD cards. There's grapes here, there's grapes there. Like a related question. Let's say you do have the SD card with the 500 photos or something like that, and you want to do an import of 100. Um, do you have to like click each or unclick each 100 or is there a way to like shift with any end. other file? Because yeah. I've tried that, yeah. you know, where you do the, the, the shift thing and then you do it at the end mm -hmm. and to, to capture them all and it's not working. Yeah, so uh, here, here's the missing steps. There's yeah. a little box down there that says uncheck all. You notice there's a little check box? Mm -hmm. You uncheck all, the check boxes go all the way around. All, all the way, right? There's no more check boxes okay. on the screen. Go to the first picture you want to import in that block. Click on that. Go to the last one in that block. Right or shift click on that. So now it's highlighted all that. And now just put your mouse on any of those check boxes. Click that, and it'll put a check box in everything that's been highlighted. Oh, okay. That was the last part. I yeah, think. that's a little bit not intuitive piece okay. in there. But once you've done that once, it's all right. It's okay. even cleaner. Uh, any other interesting import tips people want to share? <laughs> Well, if you're trying to get yourself out of, say, that like 14 million Bruce Almighty file folder thing, mm -hmm. um, would you just like have to import everything through it to reset that? Like right now, I've got mine wow. set up. Like I've got like my photos, and then I have business photos, and then I have like mm -hmm. family photos and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. And they're all just boom, 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 boom. There's like yeah. Yeah. elaborate. Yeah. Those. yeah. Would I have to go back and like open each one of those fi those files through Lightroom and then put those keywords in to um, essentially? No. What you can do is you can use this the little file folder structure that's over here and highlight the branch of your folder structure you want to apply a whole bunch of a uh, 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 keyword or keywords to that whole group. Mm -hmm. So you'd click on that. You do a, like a Control A. You know, highlight every picture that was in that block, and then you'd go and add those keywords. Okay. So what you'll find is, uh, and I wish, I'm sorry, I can't do the live thing here, but um, the keyword list that shows up over here when you're looking at your picture in either uh, gallery in you know gallery view or in, uh, preview view, um, it's just a set of words separated by commas, right? If you click on a bunch of pictures, you're going to see every keyword you've added to every single one of those pictures. And if some words have a keyword and some words don't have that keyword, there'll be a little asterisk after the word, meaning not every picture in this set has this keyword. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Right? So you might have truck 
trucks and you might have red things and you put them all together and you'll see red and trucks but there'll be asterisks there because not every truck is red mm -hmm. kind of thing right there's a really interesting trick though if you wanted to apply that keyword to the ones that don't have it just remove the asterisk mm -hmm. from the keyword list and it'll apply that keyword to all the missing ones is there any kind of AE within Lightroom because I've noticed that there are keyword groups that I didn't create that Lightroom must have somehow. I don't know if it, it, I don't know if it downloads it from the cloud, where it might say, you know, Richmond. And then there'll be all these keywords from Richmond that I didn't put in there. So uh, like you can select that and then pick and choose the keywords <coughs> out of that group that's preloaded. Um, it does that usually if you have uh, GPS geotags in the, in the EXIF data. Do you have a uh, GPS enabled just, camera? Maybe I had tagged it as being in Richmond it, at some point. Could be. And, oh, yeah. I'm using that as an example. Right. But it's, yeah. And some cameras know, allow you. Computer. Yeah. And some cameras allow you to put keywords into the yeah. camera, but boy, that, that can get you in a lot of trouble, right? You forget to clear those when you move from the from the uh, truck graveyard to the thing, and now you've mislabeled and put the bad keyword. I don't. I don't recommend that. Plus, you know how camera movie <laughs> systems are. They're really antiquated and cumbersome. Getting in and changing anything, especially words, are is terrible. That's just a nightmare. No, 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 it's a, no, it isn't. Me. I've seen the cannons. It's just as bad. So, yeah, until they figure out a way to put full-size keyboards on cameras. By the way, we're outnumbered. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. I do see the ravens. Yeah, two, two and a half, right? Two and a half. Brian's got the door. Uh, other really important metadata, remember we, we talked about, you know, all your camera settings are in there. So what if you did something like, gosh, look at that beautiful, sexy new lens. I wonder if I need to, I wonder if I want to buy that. Mm -hmm. You could go in and say, how often do I shoot at this focal length? Go to the very top of your thing and say, out of all my pictures, how many do I take at 105 millimeters or thereabouts? You can use that, you can select that metadata filter on that and it'll tell you whether you shoot in that focal distance or not because most of us don't remember, right? We, we've got these super zooms and stuff and who knows how often we shoot. You might talk yourself out of a very expensive uh, case of gas, right? Gear acquisition syndrome. If you just use some of this metadata to help you understand your own shooting styles. You know, how often you use a particular camera, a particular lens. And you know that's all really important and interesting metadata that you could use just you know in your own identification. And so I think that's kind of neat. I really wish more S uh, DLSR and mirrorless SLR cameras um, uh, had GPS in it because I would love to have geotagged half the pictures in my in my library. Yeah, I mean some of them do, but you know it's such a memory, it's such a battery hog GPS antennas, and so. You know, even cameras that have them, I don't know, it's not all that great. Um, what else? What are the, what's the other useful metadata that you've, you've found in Lightroom? Your, your rating system. But yeah. Really yeah. Metadata. Oh, mean, oh, yes, it, it, is. it is. But it's, yeah. Uh, absolutely it is. Uh, like we were talking about. Yeah, filter body would be Yeah, exactly. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, your, uh, your 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 picks and your ratings, and if you use the colors, um, comments. Um, you can even there's a couple fields that are very rarely used. Uh, a, a description of the file. I use it because I have a little plugin that exports to um, Instagram directly from Lightroom. That little comments field is, is creates the first comment. I'm gonna find that. Yeah, there's one of those. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it makes it really nice, right? So now you don't have to do the export, move it to my phone, and then post from the phone. You can literally publish directly from Lightroom, directly into Instagram. We're gonna talk about that afterwards. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, just look, just Google it. It's it's <laughs> kind of fine. I think, uh, even Canon users know how to use Google, right? J O J dates. Yeah, shortened by date. Well, finding by date. Yeah. So, but that's all in your metadata. It came out of the EXIF, and so, yeah, sorting by dates. You know, tell me everything I shot in the, this particular thing. So, you know, sorting by date is a is a. Again, it's there. So why replicate all that in a folder structure that's going to hinder you from being able to use that sort of stuff? Pete, you talked about multiple catalogs. Um, here's why you might not want to have multiple catalogs. You cannot search 
multiple catalogs simultaneously. You'd have to close a catalog, open another catalog, and as you know, you got to reboot Lightroom to start up a different catalog. So if you're looking for every red fire truck you ever shot, you might have to open up multiple catalogs to go and find all of those. And so that's the downside to multiple catalogs. The upside to multiple catalogs is that after about 10, 15, 20,000 pictures, depending on your performance of your computer, Lightroom starts to really slow down. Um, and so some of us that have, you know, north of 100,000 images in the catalog, uh, we, we have to use a lot of horsepower to keep Lightroom alive. And so, there, you know, the, the, it's, it's a trade-off, right? Um, let's see, what other interesting things about that catalog? Um, uh, optimize it. Please do optimize it. When, when it does a backup that says you want to optimize, please have it optimize your catalog. That's going to keep it relatively clean uh, and, and help you. Uh, go into your preferences and set those preview expirations to something that works for you. Um, the catalog, again, is a big clumsy thing. If you have a solid, solid state drive in your computer, putting your catalog on your solid state drive will vastly improve all of the performance in Lightroom, not just the import, but everything you do in Lightroom will be improved if you can move your catalog into a solid state drive, which is many times faster than the spinning disk. What is a solid state drive? It's basically a very fast flash memory drive inside your computer. Uh, and they, it looks to your computer just like any other disk, uh, but they're much, much faster. They're going to be more expensive per byte than a spinning hard drive, but. But uh, yeah, they you know they work exactly the same. But it's something you get put into your computer as opposed to an external hard drive. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, even even the fastest USB is really not nearly as fast as an internal like a serial ATA SSD, SSD drive. So SSD is solid state drive. So it's just basically really really fast non volatile RAM. Uh, if you don't have one, I kind of highly recommend get with a computer expert, have them add one to your computer if possible. Uh, make that your boot drive, and you'll be surprised how quickly uh, your Mac or Windows will boot. Uh, and put all the things that really need to say, go. Where have I been? Where you been all my life? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so who who does that? Who has their who has their catalog on an SSD? Yeah, I think I got some. Yeah. Yeah. Some Mac. What's that? The Mac's got. Some Macs do, yes. right? Depending on the Mac you bought and which version of, you know, the Pro or whatever. So yeah, some versions have an S uh, a solid state really drive and, and then it's got a spinny drive for your, your bulk stuff. Others it's don't. So you got to check your, your specs on your computer. It's going to come with two hard drives. One's going to have your operating system, one's the SSD. And you're going to have your data storage, which is going to be a rotating disk. Okay. Most of them. Okay, this is where um, the, the demo is not going to work because they don't have a monitor for it. But uh, we talked about viewing your metadata. So in your library mode, uh, it's just the little boxes up on the top. You click on that and your metadata windows come down. It gives you four <coughs> windows that you can sort concurrently. So you can say, uh, in this window I can pick a date, all my pictures from 2008. And in the next one you can say, uh, using this camera. And in the next folder, you can say, using this lens. And the last one, you can say, change that to over to uh, uh, pictures of Jim. Yeah, so you can have, you know, you can have your, your uh, uh, keywords. And then it'll show you every keyword that matched the other three original uh, previous criteria. And you can just pick from that the ones you want. And it'll just filter down to that subset of stuff. So you can filter four layers using the, uh, the metadata on top. Uh, we already talked about all the additional metadata, um, and like I said, some of the metadata that Lightroom itself generates, like your pics and your uh, ratings and all the other stuff that Lightroom adds into your records in the catalog, um, those things could be exported to other applications if you wanted them to, using those sidecars that we talked about. So if you were going to use Capture One or some other program, you could export all that Lightroom specific metadata into a sidecar and then you could pull that into, into Capture One and you could then migrate some of that external metadata that Lightroom provided and added to you, all your keywords, all that kind of stuff. Um, what you will find is when you, if you export to a JPEG or something, a lot of that external metadata gets added in 
Um, and so if you hand that JPEG to somebody and they pull it into Lightroom, they'll see your ratings, they'll see your colors, they'll see a lot of that metadata actually gets added as special keywords. Um, who wants to talk about collections? I use them. I use them. Use them? All right, so how do you use collections? I use mine as a photo album. So if I go somewhere, I just pick all the pictures and put them in a collection, and that's where I edit from, and then I determine which ones I'm saving and which ones I don't. And then I do my metadata kind of at the end, and maybe it's different. Like I'll put my name and my email address or whatever before I export the JPEG. I'll just click on all those in that album when I collection. <coughs> How often does your name and your email address change? Never. <laughs> so why don't you do that on import? Um, wouldn't that be more efficient than yeah, every yeah. time you go to export an album? Yeah. But that's well. how, and then I delete them. I know a lot of people keep them forever, but I'll go. Because, I mean, it gets a big long list on the left-hand side. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Mm -hmm. So then I go through and I'll delete them. Right. But, I mean, some, like my cat, I always have my Ariella folder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Certain ones I always keep as an album, but yeah. other ones I'll just delete. Right. How about you, Pete? How do you use collections? Mm -hmm. I'll go down and I'll edit and skip, skip, edit. And I say edit and I'm done. Collection, collection, collection. And then I'll export them out to the website or whatever I'm going to do with it so everybody's in a big pile and it just goes and I'm done. Mm -hmm. And then when that's done, clear the collection out. Yeah. So if you've never used a collection, it's basically just a special keyword, <coughs> the name of the collection. That's just another bit of the, of the record in Lightroom. Um, it's unique in that Lightroom gives you a special place on the left-hand side in library mode to view a particular collection by the things you've said are part of this collection. It's the same thing as if you filtered by some special keyword in general, the way you guys are using it, but it does have a lot of significance when you start talking about Creative Cloud. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, collections are neat. Uh, they're a great way to uh, you can take a, an image and add it to multiple collections. It's not creating any copies. It's just literally adding the name of the collection to the record in, in the LRCAT database file. So you can have as many pictures and as many collections as you want, and it only adds a few bits to the... It's summer. almost like the way Past does their albums for, like, if you have the, the wedding, and then there's the reception and the ceremony, and then you can have one that's just the bride. Well, there's a bunch of pictures from the, the reception and the ceremony that are the bride, but mm -hmm. that's all the bride has all just been tic tac Yeah, okay. yeah. So you could do the same. You could do it with keywords, of course, but then you'd have a lot of keywords with people's names and stuff in them. Right. Or you could create a collection for some event, and then you could even have a what are, the, what are, what are collection sets? What, are, what is the term? You, you can nest them, mm -hmm. right? You can have a collection of collections. Mm -hmm. So you can have the wedding whatever the name, bride and groom, whatever, however you want to name that. And then inside that you can have collections of the bride, the reception, the wedding party, the, you know, blah, 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 inside there. And you could then use that to very quickly filter through that stuff instead of going through the more arduous process of picking through keywords in the, in the metadata, metadata fields. So when you delete the collection, does it delete that off of the picture, or does that no. collection stay at that? New the picture stays, it? just the that, that hidden tag. keyword that makes it part of the collection just goes away. Oh, good, because yeah. I'm like, <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, you know, because like if you delete stuff, it's not going to be searching for it, right? The right. It won't go back yeah, to so, the collection. I mean, it knows it's in my all photographs, right? Yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. It, it doesn't do anything to the to the picture in the folder structure okay. that you've put it in. It just simply adds a pointer so that it's included when you look down in the name of that collection. Uh, if you ever notice, if you highlight things in a collection and you hit the delete key, it doesn't warn you because it hasn't really deleted anything. Yeah. All it's simply done is it just removed that keyword that made it. Okay. I don't, the keyword's not the right term. It's, it's more of a hidden okay. keyword. It's, a, it's an internal tag that ties it into that, that internal collection. Okay. Yeah. Very powerful for sorting and bidding stuff. Uh, especially if you're like getting stuff from multiple sources and you want to maybe e export some JPEGs for to send to your website or whatever, you drag them all, you know, you put them all in the collection from wherever they are in your file structure. Again, I'm assuming everybody's got this big clunky file structure, and it's a lot easier to find them. It's your glorious playlist, basically. Yeah, it's like a, exactly. It's like it's like a playlist. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, 
Yeah, uh, unfortunately, uh, Lightroom's file handling is really pretty ar archaic, and you have to learn how to highlight things and right-click things. And if you've highlighted pictures out of a folder or a collection or an album, and you right-click a different folder, it's going to say, "Oh, do you want me to move these things into here?" You know, you can't easily drag and drop stuff like you can. You have to know the steps, and we can't go into all that. That could be a whole workshop in itself, how to deal with the file management aspects of Lightroom. Uh, but it's, it's, yeah, it's a little clumsy. It takes a little bit of getting used to. All right, let's finally get around to talking about your edits. What we spend most of our time in Lightroom doing. When you make any edit to a photo in Lightroom, Lightroom does nothing to your original picture. In fact, your Lightroom never touches your original image at all. <laughs> at all. Ever. Um, every edit you've ever done to every picture is stored as a set of commands in the record in that LRCAT file. Oh, good lord. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's kind of scary. The way I equate it is when you were in school and they brought in the overhead projector and they put those sheets on there. And now you saw how the grass is growing. and. That, that the way I equate it, it might be wrong, but it, oh, it's just laying an overlay on it with all the changes. You're not touching the file, you just put a piece of plastic with some changes on it over the file. Um, and it's every change in the order that you made them. You don't have to pull up the history, you can always back right, up. And you can back up, yeah. Right? It's, how do you suppose it can do that? Well, it can do it because it never touched your original file. What you're seeing on the screen in your when you're in develop mode or in the library view mode, you're seeing Lightroom has reapplied every edit you've ever made to that picture when it's showing it to you. So if you could go in there and see it, it would literally look just like your history. I took my brush tool and I swooped it in this direction over here and there's a Gaussian curve and there's all the settings in there and block, and that's a record and they've added that as a list of it's commands like to apply to this, this uh, file, which makes it really powerful, right? It's, it's non-destructive editing. Um, but that also means if Lightroom ever loses your file and it can't find it and you have to re-import it, guess what? You've lost every edit you've ever made. So this is why it's super, super, super important that you back up your Lightroom catalog, you back it up again, you move it somewhere else. I keep copies on the computer, copies on my NAS, I bring copies back from, this, from the house to the shop and I put copies in the cloud. Copies everywhere. Yeah can't have too many copies of your catalog because it represents so many hundreds, maybe thousands of hours of your work. It's everything you've done to your files in Lightroom. And so uh, it's important you don't lose all that. It really is a very important file. So uh, take every step possible to, uh, to protect that thing. Uh, the previews, not so much. You can always regen the previews because it's going to just regen the preview based on the last set of edits you did. That being said, if you decide to upgrade your computer or upgrade your Lightroom mm -hmm. and then let's just say I take my catalog, I put it on my external hard drive, or I put it in the cloud, I put it whatever, get a new computer, get a new set of Lightroom, is that going to, you know, can you reload your oh, yeah. catalog? Oh, oh absolutely. It's yeah. uh, yeah. forward and backward compatible or at least uh, forward compatible? They, they are forward compatible but as we know, especially if you've done the latest updates, they're not backward compatible. So you want to make sure before you upgrade your computer, you've got a good version of your catalog that's going to be something that you can bring back in on your new computer. Yeah. Okay. Um, you don't have to re-import your pictures. You just have to move the LRCAT file in any of the previews if you care to. But again, previews can be regenerated. Don't bother with those. It's just the LRCAT file or files that you want to just make sure you bring them back and you put them somewhere where you can just tell Lightroom after you've reinstalled it on your new computer, here's my catalog. And you just go into the file, load catalog, and tell it where you've put that LRCAT file. It's really pretty easy. Do, do you know if I'm backing up my MacBook to an external? Wait, wait, hold on a second. Before I leave that, what you do need to make sure you do, though, is when you move your pictures over, Right, because you'll have to do that when you right. move to another computer. Make sure you put them exactly the same place on your new computer as your old, so Lightroom doesn't have to go find them again. Because you don't want to have Lightroom lose those pointers. Right? So the goal is to, to get all those 
old school file structures down to whatever is most optimized in Lightroom and then move everything. Yeah, they'll go a lot more quickly if you don't have a big folder structure to go with them as far as, you know, migrating them across. But, you know, it, it, it depends on how you move the files. Mm -hmm. If you move them across a wired network, there you you know most modern computers are pretty fast. Or you can export everything out as a TIFF file. Oh God, no! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. So back to okay. So if you're backing up, is it backing up your catalog, or are you actually taking your catalog and making a copy and <coughs> depositing it somewhere else? No, it's just making another copy. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So normal. I'm allergic to water. I'm copying it. They're not moving. A normal when you, computer when, backup will be. Copying my catalog or no? Oh yeah, if you back up okay. your computer on top of that, you're going to get backups of all your of every Lightroom catalog and the backups of those. Okay. If you go into your photos album, you'll see a folder called either Lightroom catalog or catalog, depending on the version when you first installed it. You go in there and you'll see my catalog .lrcat. really huge file, uh, or something else if you change the name when you did the uh, the Lightroom install. I tend to make new Lightroom uh, uh, catalog versions like every year. That way I can have an archive of a year ago or two years ago or three years ago uh, because cause I'm that way. Uh, They're not all that useful. Again, what's if it's two or three versions back, if you back it up the length of the catalog every two weeks, that's really all that's going to be very useful to you. Beyond that, you're going to lose your last month or two's worth of, right. of images, right? Edits. Okay. So it's I the edits. Actually copy and paste it to an external. If I'm backing to the external, it's backing it up. Yeah. If you're using a tool to do your your regular computer backups and your photos folder, wherever the folder is where your catalogs, and you can see it. If you go into um, File Preferences, um, can't remember which tab. You, you'll see it. It's the one that says talks about the catalog. There's a button that says Show in Explorer or Show in Finder if you're a Mac, and it'll show you the path that goes to find the Lightroom catalog. Okay. All right, let's talk a little bit about Creative Cloud. Who wants to give a definition of what the Creative Cloud is? More money. Ten bucks a month. <laughs> <laughs> it's more money. <laughs> more money, ten bucks a month. Well worth it. Anybody else? It's actually cheaper. You sit down and do the math and you think, okay, those in the old days, uh, major upgrades to Lightroom and Photoshop were three and four hundred dollars and they'd come out every two years. Mm -hmm. So you do the math and actually the subscription is cheaper mm -hmm. in the long run if you want to keep up with, and you have to these days, camera equipment, you know, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And you're getting updates live, right? We, we just saw it last week. We got a whole new set of updates to Lightroom and Photoshop. We had to go seven years without upgrading before buying that way. Right, right. So that's so that's one thing that Creative Cloud does is it converts <laughs> these uh, monolithic applications, you said you're on Lightroom 6 now, mm -hmm. um, into um, subscription services. So that's one thing and that's what people, a lot of people think, oh, that's what the Creative Cloud is all about. But it's a lot more than that. Um, it really is changing Adobe's tool set from being <laughs> monolithic standalone applications where you work on your stuff to really full collaboration tools. So if Pete and I are working on uh, a project uh, and I'm doing certain uh, parts of it and maybe I'm doing the tonal curves, but Pete's doing all of the, uh, you know, the brushwork, the dodging and burning, we can share that information over the internet or over any other kind of network using Creative Cloud as the conduit for us to share that, uh, that, that stuff and work live. Uh, another thing you can use the Creative Cloud for, because it is has all these great networking features, when I travel, I travel with a tablet. I don't travel with my full-blown computer, but I want to make sure that all of my really important pictures at the end of the day are going to survive a hijacking, uh, a theft of my computer bag, uh, me being stupid, whatever it is, <laughs> fall, drop, you know, falling into a river, whatever. So at the end of the day, I take my most my, my, my potential pictures, the ones that I think are going to be really worth having, portfolio worthy, uh, you know, money getting worthy, and I add those to Lightroom Mobile, and Lightroom Mobile synchronizes them through the cloud, and they're on my NAS back at home in, you know, minutes, uh, depending on your Wi-Fi and your hotel or whatever. <laughs> uh, so that's really important. It gives you that. And, you know, now I can edit all my photos on the airplane 
using Lightroom Mobile yeah. or whatever, and guess what? Since it's non-destructive, that's just a set of edits. That's being applied to the actual files, and when I get back home, I can see them in full res and blah, 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 and so I can you know, be productive on the road. Does everything that you you like everything that you upload to Lightroom Creative Cloud, that it, version or edition, do they all go in the cloud? We're gonna talk about what you said. Yeah, so what I'm with the straight so. yeah, yeah, so what I described just there has to do with collections. So you can take a collection and one of the options you can say is synchronize this with Lightroom Mobile. That basically enables a connection through Creative Cloud to any other devices you have in your subscription. So for me, it's my tablet, it's my second computer, those kinds of things. And so now everything in that collection, synchronized through the cloud, is visible and available through to my collaborators or my multiple devices, if that's the case. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, We'll talk in a minute about what the new Lightroom CC is all about and how that's that's fundamentally different. Um, another thing Creative Cloud can do for you is it can be your conduit for sharing pictures with your customers, your models, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So you can take your collection, you can say synchronize it with mobile, which puts it in the cloud, and now you can say Adobe generate a private website that contains just those pictures and give me a link that I can share with people and they can see just those images just as I, ex I want them to see them and they can like and comment on them and I see those likes and comments back inside the collection. But they can't download it, can't do anything to them. <clears throat> Only if you enable download. So it eliminates the need for a Pixie set or a Smokemon or a... Yeah, a a Avia, all these other like things. So um, uh, it used to be, a, you know, you'd export and then you'd publish to some external yeah. service. Then you'd send the link to your customer or your client or whatever. They'd probably find, you have to have some mechanism for them to create their comments or suggestions or pick their favorites or whatever. Then you'd have to go back into Lightroom with Lightroom over here and their comments over here and you'd have to tag or whatever you used to use to synchronize all that stuff back up again. And then you could continue editing. Well, with Creative Cloud, you could just say, okay. Pick your top five and give me comments on all these proofs that I'm sending you, and all that stuff comes back in real time to you. Um, and, like Pete was just saying, if they're final edits, maybe they're for a customer, you could say allow downloads and allow downloads at full resolution mm. or something smaller. Really depends on, on you. Mm. So now you can use it as the tool that you use to present or sell your right. finished products to your customers. Especially you if you're not sales driven with prints and it's more yeah if it's a digital it's all, it's all front yeah. end yeah, um, yeah. you know I'm a, and, and I, I love in-person sales because man the, you know print business is, is great you know and when people see their 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 images yeah. in big print that's a very different thing but a lot of photographers are digital only mm -hmm. and this is a great mechanism and you already have it right. you just have to take advantage of it um, and as of last week in the latest update, guess how much storage you have in, in Creative Cloud? Ten gig? You have one terabyte. What? what? Wait, I thought you had to what? pay for it after no. ten gig. Nope. With your Creative Cloud subscription as of last week's update, you have one terabyte oh, in the cloud. You could put your entire if it's uh if it's, only one if it's a terabyte, some of us have some of us have have picture uh, libraries <laughs> bigger than a terabyte. Right. But you can put a good chunk of it mm. up in the cloud. Um, and the reason they're doing that is because they're 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 changing that model. But now, um, once you stop paying them ten bucks a month, that goes away. Yeah, well, it's like it's like any cloud service, right? The cloud, right. the data is in the cloud. It's encrypted. You have the keys. It's you're the only one that has access to the data. The Adobe people can't see it either. It's all through public-private key encryption stuff. If you let your subscription lapse, the keys just get thrown away. Do and, you need, <laughs> and then you have a good crowd. Do you need to have Lightroom installed to view it? In other words, I create a an account. I start uploading pictures up there. Mm -hmm. Do I have to be on a computer with Lightroom to see these pictures? No, no. You send them the link. They can look on your phone. They can be. It's it's a website. It literally is a web page. You get a short URL, and it goes there. And it's basically just a little gallery view. They can do a slideshow. 
Again, like I said, you could do likes and comments. They'll need to log in when they do that so you know who the comments are coming back from. But they don't have to create an Adobe account. You could just Facebook, any of these other uh, um, authentication exchange mechanisms. Facebook is what I tell my people. You just click, log on with Facebook so I see who these yeah, comments are coming back from. Um, and then they get it. But yeah, it, you, okay. it's, it, you make it public. It's, it's a two-step thing. You right-click on the collection. You say, share this to Lightroom Mobile. You click on, right-click on it again. You say, make this public. Once that synchronization is done, you can say, go to that website so you can check it out first, or copy the short URL, and then you can paste that into a message to your client or whoever you want to share that with, and voila, there it is. Right. So pretty neat stuff, right? Yeah. Um, so if I do that and I do that share to Lightroom Mobile, is that what allows me to pull it up on my phone, like in Lightroom on my phone, and look at yeah. it? Yeah, mm -hmm. you got it. Hmm. Yep. And if you ever want to stop sharing stuff, you just right click on the whole collection and where the little double arrow thing is and you say stop sharing and it goes away. Hmm. Stop synchronizing? You just stop synchronizing and again, because they're just, it's data in the cloud. Well, that confused me at first. I had like, you know, 3,000 pictures and then 800 were <coughs> synchronized. I'm like, I don't even think I was synchronizing anything. Yeah, of course you have to be connected. Well, depending on your settings, you obviously don't want to be out there and it's you know using broadband to try to synchronize a terabyte of data. But by default, most of your mobile devices only synchronize, you know, over a over a, a LAN or Wi-Fi connection that's not going to kill your your data plan. Uh, so that's really neat stuff. And um, again, the the Creative Cloud stuff just keeps getting better and better, and I, and I like it. Um, but let, so that gets us to what happened uh, last week with the big new update. Um, who, who's done the update from Lightroom CC? All right, so who remembers when Coke came out with Coke Classic and Coke. New Coke? Yeah, how did that work? Yeah. Uh, so that's what, I don't know why Adobe thought that was a good idea, this renaming scheme, but your traditional Lightroom on your computer is now called Lightroom Classic CC. They just changed the name when they and they added a few a few features. Uh, the, the little brush filter thing is kind of neat, but tweaking around. Um, that's really the that's really the only change to that is really a, a name change. And, and again, some of those uh, masking uh, filters are kind of neat. Uh, but what they did add is they added a new version of Lightroom. If you go into Creative Cloud, you notice you can download this other version of Lightroom now called Lightroom Creative Cloud. How confusing is that? So they, they repurposed the name to a whole different product. It has about 80% of the functionality of the Lightroom that you know, but it's all web-based. Your catalog and your pictures are all so in the cloud. So you're not using like, like, are you not using like heavy RAM, all the fun stuff that you need all of that crap for for Lightroom and Photoshop? It still runs on your computer. Uh -huh. It's still, it's still a, a local application, but instead of your catalog being local and your file structure being local, all that's in that terabyte of storage out in the cloud. Mm -hmm. So it works kind of well as long as you've got really good internet service. Right. And then you get 10 bucks a month. Well, they're going to get you their 10 bucks a month anyway. But now that you've got this well, terabyte of data, you can put them in. Say you get hit with hard times. Now you don't have the 10 bucks a month, but you're going to have it six months down the line, and you cancel it. That cloud is gone. That catalog is gone up in the cloud. If you're local and you re-up in six months, your catalog's still there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not saying there's a downside. Yeah. To yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I'm not saying it's I perfect, and I don't I think mean, it's ready for prime time yet. But this is where Adobe is going, right? They already forced us down this path of going into a subscription service, right. and we found, for the most part, it's it's worth it. The the, mm -hmm. the, the, the real time updates are good, and the additional features like the Creative Cloud linkage and stuff is good, but. Your monolithic Lightroom is dead. It's end of life. There will be no more. I can buy the actual no product. Right? It was alive this afternoon when I used it. Well, <laughs> you can continue yeah, to run it, but there, they will, there will be not another standalone monolithic Lightroom. And, um, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and, and tech support, you know, the service of support is going to go away, too. There was another point, so too, where the newer cameras are only get they're gonna make it. Yeah. Yeah. They're gonna force us old <coughs> that they use and go all the time to get the new stuff. I just say monthly bills. 
Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I know I contacted I Adobe with my six before I had it on the just separate laptop and they told me that they couldn't help me with it at all. Oh, they told me, no ma'am, we're not going to help you at all. That's when I went to the subscription oh, service yeah. on my new laptop. Yeah. yeah, they told me that. Yeah, yeah. they told me there's nothing I can do for you. Nothing yeah. at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you know why you have to copy? I mean, I'm not doing it because I don't have room to copy my catalog. What's the purpose of they, the catalog? They made the catalog 15 to 20% more efficient. Yeah. And so they changed the format a little bit so that uh, your imports are going to go faster. Uh, switching between library and, and develop mode is going to go faster, and certain other things that were GPU intensive. Exports are faster too. Yeah, um, GPU intensive stuff like uh, clone stamping and some of the uh, filters and brush stuff are depending on your GPU. Some GPUs work better than others. Processor unit. Yeah, no. Yeah. Uh, My mind's old. That's why. <laughs> yeah. And I need to so, get a new machine, but so I can't. So I guess yeah, I'm just going to wait and get a new machine and start this. all over because I can't I can't upgrade. I'm like, I've got, I've got like 178 gigabytes left on my 500. Mac officially has said, oh, you can't upgrade anymore. You have to get a new computer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. they all want our money. But you now it comes with features. What else? Other thoughts and comments, guys? Mm -hmm. So that latest update is going to take a lot of space, isn't it? What's that? The latest iCloud Lightroom update. Uh, well, what do you mean a lot of space? I mean, the, the, the new version of Lightroom is actually smaller because it's new code. It's a lot more efficient than, than classic CC currently is. Um, Again, it's still not ready for prime time. There's some things that just aren't quite there. Do you have to choose there. one or the other? No, no, you can run both. I'm running both on this computer. Um, and so what happens is anything that you currently have shared as a you know share with Lightroom collection just magically shows up in the new Lightroom CC as your library. There's also there's a button you can press that says take my entire library and move it into the cloud. Um, uh, which you, I guess you could yeah, do yeah, if you're yeah. under a terabyte, and, and it would it would eventually work. Um, and it's going to have a local cache. So if there are pictures that you're you're working on, you're not having to go out and use your you know your Wi-Fi and your internet to do all that stuff. It's uh, you can you can set the amount of local storage that the new Lightroom CC will use. So if you're working on a project, it's still going to be local. It's relatively fast. Then it's going to synchronize all that data back up into the cloud uh, when it has time. But if you only want to update Classic, I'm using Classic and I'm going to use the sure cloud because I don't do with Instagram and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. If I go in and I look at that LCT my catalog, whatever, and I see it's however many gigabytes, mm -hmm. I have to have twice that free in order to do the update, right? Because it's going to duplicate that? Um, you're probably going to want at least twice that free because it's going to create some temporary files and then it's going to create the new file and eventually it's going to do, remove the temporary file when it's done with the conversion. Yeah. 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 Anything older than six months, just get rid of it. I'm nervous to delete all that. But I have backups. But I'm like, what if I don't, you know, what if I don't realize I didn't do it and then I write over the backup? Well, like I said, just leave Lightroom running when you go to, back to erase those files. You know, you're not actually going to erase the one that's currently running. Now, if you have multiple catalogs, like Pete was saying, you got to make sure that you're, you know, you keep the multiple catalogs you're using. But um, yeah, if you just have one catalog and use that all the time, just you know, keep two or three backups, and anything that's older than that, just you know, change the modified sort by modified date and get rid of all that stuff and. You'll magically have all kinds of room. And then once you do that, then you have to then go back and delete your other catalog at some point, right? Once you start working in classic and you realize it's fine. Yeah, you I'm not going to delete my uh, my old Lightroom catalog anytime soon, just okay. in case you know, I run into something and I like it. You know, it's just not working well. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, it's that's only that's only the latest version, right? It's not going back and mm -hmm. updating all of your backups. So. Going back to t the tags. On the files. Mm -hmm. There's a little trick that I like to use. A lot of people do it through Bridge, but after you call your pictures through Bridge, bring them to that room, and then you find out, well, there's a handful here, a whole bunch that I'm never going to use. If you go into a room and you highlight it and you hit the X, it'll mark it as rejected. 
You can go through all your pictures, all your folders, and just keep rejecting them. And once you want to get rid of them, you go into photo, rejected, and it's going to ask you, you want to delete them off a of disk too, and you say yes, and they all go away. <laughs> so you're clearing out your catalog of the bad ones that you don't want, plus the dead files. Right. Yeah, okay, pick I a rejector, just there's some more of those, you know, internal keywords, uh, tags. Be very useful for me. Yeah. Yeah, I do that all the time as I'm culling through, I find stuff, you know, missed focus, whatever, cropped off a finger, or whatever, you know, so anything that makes that image not usable, I just, as I'm doing my initial call, I just you X, 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 You don't have to blow it away right away either. You can close Lightroom, bring it back up, they're still going to be marked with rejected. So mm -hmm. if you're not sure, you, man, nah, maybe I want to get rid of it. You can do that. And when I do three weeks later, if I don't go back to them, goodbye. So... We've talked about how Lightroom is very good for database and organizing. Um, what makes it good, better, or worse than some, I guess, other editing software as far as editing goes? Like, is there a reason we, like, anybody in the room prefers Lightroom to Photoshop, or is it all something everybody uses <laughs> together? Yeah. Easier. I mean, <laughs> I. Uh, I'm just curious as to how people. I feel. so I'll, I'll offer my opinion, and I'll, I'll open it up for the rest of the folks in the room. Um, I'm in the uh, when I look at a picture, if I can do it all in Lightroom, I'll do it in Lightroom because it's really easy. Some of Lightroom's editing tools are pretty good. The dodging and burning and all that kind of stuff does it does a marvelous job of keeping tonal, uh, you know, just correct and, and all that kind of stuff. Other things Lightroom is terrible at. It's clone stamp tool is awful, and you know some of the other tools that are in there. It's better in this latest version. It's still not great because uh, it's just it's the algorithm for that is not nearly as sophisticated as say in Photoshop. Um, Although they're both Adobe products. I know. Well, that's okay. Um, like I said, Lightroom is not a photo editing application. Right. It's got some photo editing tools, and for a vast majority of pictures, the tools in Lightroom, the editing tools in Lightroom, will get you the the effect you're looking for, the you know the proper processing. If I look at a picture and I say, I know I have to do something in Photoshop with this. I got, I've, you know, I've got to use layers or all the things in Photoshop that Lightroom doesn't have. I'll do that first because I know that Photoshop is going to make a copy of the original picture, and then I can apply all the non-destructive edits into the uh, in in Lightroom when I've turn back around and brought it back into the you know, Lightroom. So you'll edit in Photoshop first? So better, yeah, I was going to say you... From Lightroom, right. right Right. click the picture, but edit in Lightroom. You didn't do anything in Lightroom yet. I haven't done anything in Lightroom yet. If I think I'm going to need Photoshop, I'm going to I'm gonna do that. I'm going to do those first. Uh -huh. You know, I've got a... I've got a light pass together. Yeah, yeah, I've got, you know, like all these lights and stuff, you know, they get in the corners of the pictures and stuff because I want them close to my subjects. Well, I need that out of there. I want this, I want wherever the backdrop is. So I'm going to pull them into light, oh, Photoshop first because its ability to cut and do a content aware fill is way better than anything that Lightroom could do. Mm -hmm. So then I do all of those and if there's anything else I need to do that Photoshop is good at, like, you know, clone stamping all the blemishes out of somebody's face in a, in a nice portrait. Right. I can do that so much faster and, and better and get a more natural look out of Photoshop. Then I'll exit back into Lightroom, do all the Lightroom tonal curves. Yeah, just color things. correction and stuff yeah, like that yeah, that exactly. I usually... Mm -hmm. Cropping, all that stuff. Yeah. So I've, hit, I've hit Lightroom twice. I'll start in Lightroom, go into Photoshop, come back into Lightroom, and then touch up there. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Photoshop, Photoshop first. The only differ the only downside to that is, you know, it's it's gonna say, do you want to open uh, Photoshop with Lightroom edits applied? Mm -hmm. So it's gonna basically apply your edits. So now they're no longer non-destructive. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna have to. It basically bakes ah, your, your okay. edits from Lightroom into the photograph as it exports to Photoshop. Then Photoshop can go on. But you now you can't back out any of those edits. Right. But the original's still there. I mean, if you totally oh, there's around, still a, yeah, you, to yeah, because now you get the dash edit version of the file and you go back. But now you got to if you wanted to go back, you got to go back to the beginning. Then I go back into Photoshop and redo that. <laughs> so yeah, different different approaches. How about you, Pete? Okay, depending on what I'm doing. Sometimes, most, if I'm doing an HDR, I'll run through Photomatic. Then I'll go back into Lightroom, mm -hmm. touch it up a little bit in Lightroom, go into Photoshop, 
do whatever I'm going to do in Photoshop and bring it back in Lightroom, and then I'll export. And I'll export a small one, watermark for my Facebook, and then a full res to a different folder. So I have two exports that I'll click. And I use the I'll use the like the rating system, and I'll pick like three or four, and I'll make them all five stars, and then I'll just show the rating as five stars, and then those are the ones I'll upload, and I'll put the watermark on. That way, I know, you know. So I mean, I don't know. Like the way I the way I upload things is I'll have I'll upload them, uh, and then I'll do like I'll have the let's assume it's like Susie's photo shoot, and then you'll have I'll have a folder that's raw, and then I'll have a photo that's edit, and then I'll have the file that's like Facebook. I don't know if that's redundant or over the top or if there's a way to do well, that the better. The word generated for Facebook is a 4 by 6 because Facebook's going to compress it even more. So if somebody wants to download it and print it, have fun. <laughs> God, I hate loading. I mean, that's I hate loading things in Facebook. It looks so crappy. And I don't know how some other people get them to look so good. Um, in your export dialog box, use the option that says scale to long edge and put 1200. Long edge 1200 is the optimal size for Facebook images. It'll, it'll minimize their compression, which is awful. Mm -hmm. So no matter what size you That's export, in the export it at? Yeah, it's going to scale it so that the longest edge, whether it's portrait right. or landscape, will be 1,200 bytes. Okay. And then that, you put that up on, on Facebook. Because I've always wondered that. I've seen some other people that are, that are photographers and their picture looks so crisp and Yeah, that's, that's what they're like, doing. Man. They're just using that, that little option in the export dialog box to scale it to optimize for, for Facebook. Now, I know you can you can crop to a certain size, like 8x10, 4x6, 5x7 in Lightroom. Can you resize the image mm -hmm. to fit those in Lightroom? Well, in, in or, export. Because in, okay. remember, Lightroom doesn't ever touch your original picture, right. right? So it's only the export, and you can set the export to be a certain size. No bigger than, you know, two megabytes or something. Two, there have been 2,000 times, kilobytes. Yeah, there have been times where I've gone to, like, print something, and, like, it's cutting off too much in the, in the print option. I'm like, well, okay. Do I have to go into Photoshop and resize every picture that I wanted to do individually or not? But I guess I can go in Lightroom and export and just pick the size of the file. Yeah, pick the size of the file. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.